So this is a new series that we're doing here on the Passionate Homeschooler podcast, and we're calling it The Language of Art. And to explain what that means, we have co-founder Deanna Hakenin here with us again today. Hi, Deanna. Hi, Joel. So um, I had this idea of doing this quite a while ago. Um, I go to a lot of museums, and I used to be a curator. And so I have this love of understanding art. And I know a lot of people, when they view art, they're not really sure what they're looking at. Um, And you can obviously have a reaction to it. And it can be an emotional reaction. You can feel connection. But um, there's a language in understanding art, the visual arts in particular, but also the literary arts. And um, you have an expertise in film. And it's, you know, whenever we go to, if we see a movie together, then it's almost like we are seeing two different movies because we approach them so differently. Yeah, I that's I, for sure. <laughs> I think I approach film the way most people look at paintings or maybe read great literature or even poetry and it's just this very sort of surface understanding and for me if a film takes my brain off you know my work and everything going on in my life I'm happy I'm very pretty easy to please in a film Um, but then you know we'll be talking about it and you blow me away with your knowledge. So um, I thought it would be fun for us to kind of dive in to art. And turn the tables a little bit. Yeah. Uh, And I want to be really clear about this. I I have just the most rudimentary understanding, if I have any understanding at all, of, uh, of the language of art, which is why we're using it as our title, so this is a, 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 a this is something that we're presenting because having to figure out how to teach art is not always an easy thing unless you know the vocabulary and the grammar of art and using the term language is really a great metaphor in this case because it it, it isn't a language and it does have its own rules uh, and understanding those rules will really aid to understanding the art and getting as much out of it as possible. So I am in the position of being somewhat illiterate when it comes to some of these ideas, and I'm happy to put myself before you uh, to learn. Great. I used to teach college and I taught humanities. And one of my favorite things was to teach the language, whether it was the language of Shakespeare or the language of paintings or the language of sculpture, and to teach my students on how to get a deeper read and understanding of what they were looking at, um, whether it's, you know, reading a great work of poetry or looking at a painting. And I would take my students to museums every semester, several different classes to several different museums in Los Angeles. And we would talk about it. And by time, you know, that was always later in the semester. And they had this vocabulary, they understood. And so it was so so rewarding to go around the museum and have them observing paintings. And I would a lot of times just kind of walk around and listen to them having conversations amongst themselves. And being able to really have this level of understanding that aided them. And I used to tell them, you know, even if you're not into art, this is something great to learn because you can really impress a date, right? You can take a date to a museum, if nothing else, and you can well, let's, you know, let's kind be of really, impress them. Yeah, let's be really clear about this, though, because, uh, you know, it, there's, there's a temptation to look at some of these abstract ideas as being so far removed from reality that the only way that you can get value out of it is uh, dinner conversation right. or, or party conversation. And uh, both of us, I, I feel, have this belief that art has a value that's very personal and you can get more than just enjoyment out of it. You can get a, a real I want to say like a spiritual value, something that can touch you to your core and identify things about your own life that can be really worthwhile and and open up some doors to understanding the world in a way you didn't think was possible. Absolutely. So it's it's not, 
it, it really isn't just this kind of uh, removed uh, knowledge that only elites can can yeah, discuss absolutely not. at a cocktail party. Right. Absolutely not. And, you know, the reason why I would say that to my students is a lot of them would just be like, oh, I don't want to go. And I'm like, well, you know, you, you got to find something to catch. Right. And I was teaching um, at a community college and it was a general education class. And we've had this conversation before. So my students weren't necessarily there um, to learn the material. They were there to, you know, check the box so they can move on. So I tried to, however I could catch them. Oh, you got to do what you got to do. Got to do, right? And hopefully, um, you know, we're now working with a lot of homeschool families or helping families make that transition. And so this is just another way of teaching the great works across time. And so why not pull up a painting? Yeah, and understand why they're great. Um. Yeah, and exactly. What does this do? So um, I just think it's it can just add a richness. And so if you're teaching history, these are primary sources. These are firsthand sources. This is a Renaissance painting that we're going to talk about. And it tells us about the Northern Renaissance. Yeah, and, and of course, at The Passionate Homeschooler, we are big believers in the primary source because Absolutely. there's nothing like going to the original source of the uh, the history being made that gives you a first-handed view of what happened rather than going through uh, secondary evaluations or, or secondary impressions of what happened in history. Absolutely. And particularly, and we'll talk about it as we go through this painting today, that things change over time and interpretations change. And in um, the modern era with postmodernism, if you pick up a history book, it may be going through a what they call a particular lens. So maybe they're looking at the Renaissance through a feminist lens. Well, that's going to be very different. And you're going to have a very different read of this painting. But if you just go look at the painting and you understand it in the context of when it was painted, instead of trying to put a modern lens on it, then it just illuminates the culture that you're studying so much more. And it makes it, um, I think the paintings and even reading the primary sources, particularly if they're letters or diaries, it really humanizes history and it's so relatable and rich. And these, again, a lot of times we would call those micro histories, particularly a diary, but that is a snapshot of someone's life and how amazing is it to get sort of the inner monologue of someone's life 500 years ago. It's just incredible. And even more fulfilling if you can take that and connect it to the larger culture. Absolutely. That's why we call them micro histories. Here's one snapshot. Now we're going to take that and we can see how that in, interjects into the larger history. And it's just, it's so rich. I mean, that's why, you know, I'm a historian because I, I absolutely love looking in the past and we can learn so much about ourselves, our own culture, what's happening in the world. And it can, help us better understand, you know, things that are happening now. And we can look back and say, okay, they got through this or, oh, wow, they were inspired by this. And those things, you know, keeps us going. All right. Well, so what do you have for us today? So today we are looking at a Northern Renaissance painting by uh, Jan van Eyck. And, oh, I got to get used to uh, back to my teaching mode with my uh, slides here. And so this is the Arnolfini portrait by Jan van Eyck. It was painted in 1434. And this portrait next to what you're seeing here, um, this portrait of a man, it's called Man in Red Turban. And it's believed that that is a self-portrait of Jan van Eyck. And that's from 1433. So this is what the artist looks like. But we're going to be looking at this Arnolfini portrait. Now, when I was getting my degree in art history, this was called the Arnolfini wedding. And we'll talk about that sort of idea of the modern um, interpretation over time, because there's been quite a bit of scholarship in recent years on this painting. And some things that were once sort of accepted or understood they're now maybe being questioned. And with time, we have a better understanding. Sometimes we get new documents that are translated or found. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see how things change. 
And um, so it's now called the Arnolfini Portrait. To, um, it is in the National Gallery in London. And um, if you ever get to there, to see this painting in person is so incredible. I remember just standing in front of it and being overtaken with emotion because I had studied it. And it's just to see it, I don't know, I, I get emotional now just thinking about that moment. And so Arnolfini portrait, this was... Um, now, now, before you continue, I just, I, I want to preface this by saying, you, you did show this to me before. Uh, right. before this particular uh, episode that we're shooting okay. right now. and But I do want to say that your emotional reaction to it is quite a bit different from my reaction. Yeah. As I look at it right now, I don't really have much of an emotional reaction to it. Now, right. I get this. I, I understand why you might have a reaction, whereas I don't, because you have studied it and you know the subtext, you know the story behind it. And all I can see is, you know, what is immediately obvious to me because I don't have the, the knowledge behind right. it. And I right. Think so my reaction is necessarily fairly superficial. Exactly. And I think that's the difference. Like you can look at a painting and as you go through museums, and I even do this now, um, particularly large museums like the Metropolitan Museum of Art or the Getty Museum um, in Los Angeles. And so um, I think after a while you stop seeing and then you just walk through the galleries because it's sensory it's, overload. It's, yeah, it's, it's uh, numbing. Yes. And, but, um, you know, if you were to just see this painting, I mean, it's, yeah, yeah, it's this old fashioned man and a woman, right? But um, we're going to go through what makes it special and what makes it incredible. And knowing these kind of details and understanding, I don't expect everybody to walk into a museum and have a, you know, a degree in art history because not everybody's going to do that. But to seek out this kind of knowledge or to understand it or to want to understand it. I mean, I go to my favorite pastime or one of them is to go to a museum. That's how I decompress. That's how I recharge. And I see so many people that just walk through. I mean, and you see people that read the wall text and really stare. And um, then you see people that just kind of walk through. But if you read the wall text, it's really informative most often. Um, I see a lot of people with the headphones or the little things listening um, the listening guides. Now, I'm not an audio person. I, you know, I that don't would be listen, me. Yeah, I don't listen to audiobooks, so I'm not normally. I don't do those, but I read every wall text. Um, I'm interested in that, and and it really does make that painting come alive. And that's what I wanted to do in our new series here, The Language of Art, is to, yeah, we can see and we can describe, and you know, that's a very first sort of level. But let's go deeper, and particularly for parents that are teaching their kids, because when you start learning the language of paintings, and because we're dealing with painting today, another time it'll be poetry. But when you start learning these things, then you can apply them. For instance, iconography or symbolism in paintings, and particularly the West, but also in world paintings, different cultures, different things mean different things. And so, for instance, um, in the Roman culture, a peacock was a symbol of Juno, the goddess. And um, I would she, not have known that. Right. But then when you get into early Christianity, the peacock becomes a symbol of the resurrection. And it's interesting how that's. I wouldn't that have sort known of, that either. <laughs> and so it, it evolves, right? And so when you see the peacock in Roman, art this is what it means and this is what i'm talking about the language because there is a <laughs> language that um each individual time period and culture is speaking and a lot of it so if you're dealing in the west post you know 300 ce then you're a lot of the christian symbolism is going to carry all the way through all the way probably until late 1800s you know, oh, so and you know, as far as the symbolism goes, uh, I, I do want to interject on that point because from my background, uh, you mentioned that I have a film background, I have a literature background as well. Right. And one of the things that uh, sort of bothered me as I was studying, um, you know, uh, in 
in, in an academic way. Right. These ideas. Uh, one of the things that bugged me was something that I would come to call symbol hunting, uh, which just simply means uh, a professor or some kind of teacher telling the students to read a novel or some work fiction and find all the symbols oh. uh, and then report on the symbols that they found. It's called, it's symbol hunting. Huh. And to me, that was completely arbitrary because it, there were yeah. no standards. There, there was no, uh, well, okay, we're calling this the language of art. So there wasn't a language of symbolism right. uh, within this kind of exercise. And right. That is, um, that to me, that's just a complete dereliction of your, your duty as a, a teacher. Right, yeah. And because, it's, because of its arbitrariness. Now, right. what you're talking about here is an accepted cultural standard of symbolism that everyone would have known. It, it would have been right. part of the fabric of the culture. And if you, um, so to identify a symbol in that context is not arbitrary symbol hunting. It's, it's really a means of communication. And so in that sense, if we carry forward this metaphor of the language of art, knowing what these symbols means is equivalent to vocabulary. Absolutely. It's, it's not grammar. It's no. not about structure. It's about what these individual word equivalents means. Would you say uh, that that's yeah. fair? I think that's absolutely spot on. Um, and I used, when I was teaching, I would say it's sort of getting the inside joke of the painting, right? Because in that era, everyone would have known that, you know, that dove represented this or that candle represented this. But in the context of yeah, in the context of the day, however, it wasn't an inside joke because when we think of inside jokes, we think of something that insulates us or allows us to communicate within a certain subculture. Right. And so the many times uh, knowledge of an inside joke can grant you some kind of superiority that you would hold over yeah, whoever is outside your group that doesn't understand what the joke is. Yeah. But in this case, you're talking about the culture at large. So mm -hmm. it's equivalent to knowing Latin in Rome. You yes. know, you just know how people talk. It's just part of the day-to-day -day culture, much like, you know, if uh, if we were to go to a party, by the way, we're, sh we're uh, uh, recording this episode in July of 2020. <laughs> so, um, so we don't have parties at this moment in right. time. But were we to have a party, it would be the equivalent of going there and discussing the uh, the latest episode of The Walking Dead or A Game of Thrones, right? It's I wouldn't part be of the able culture. To do, unfortunately, yeah, me neither. <laughs> so but, I can discuss the paintings, but I yeah, can't but but the that. point is yeah, that yeah. everyone knows it. Everyone, and right? and I want to make that really clear because uh, not knowing what these symbols are and then identifying them within the context of the work of art is not an arbitrary uh, endeavor. No, and we know this from primary sources because for instance, in the Renaissance, um, there was a great biographer of Vasari and some of his stuff is kind of like seeing a supermarket tabloid you know, magazine or something, but we learn a lot, we know a lot. And there was a lot of, you know, the, there was a lot of writing going on. By so that he was time. the TMZ of ancient Rome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, kind of like Suetonius, Suetonius yeah, for Rome. Suetonius. That's what Vasari was mm -hmm. for um, the Renaissance painters. But we know a lot. You know, he kind of um, embellished a little bit on their personal lives and maybe some scandals and things like that. But, you know, humans are humans across space and time. Yeah. And he's a primary source. And he's a primary source. Okay, so let's get into this painting. Um, and I know um, we, I already showed this to you just to kind of talk to you about my vision for this series. But I'm going to ask you to kind of go back to that first look mm -hmm. and um, just, you know, what was your impression, you know, of this painting? Well, I, to me, to, okay, my first look, and given my 21st century um, context now, is that we have um, 
kind of a feeling of constriction. The room is, it seems uh, kind of crowded to me. Right. Um, the, the, the people in the frame, uh, they, they seem, you see, see, he's looking directly at us, mm -hmm. but she's looking down. So my take on that is he has, um, he's not looking at her. Uh, and so even though they're holding hands, I don't sense a lot of intimacy in this. Again, this is my own right, immediate right. take, uh, given my own worldview. Right. So, you know, uh, I'm fairly sure given our conversations that I'm way off base. <laughs> with no, this. because I you know and that's the thing. A lot of people will look at a painting and that's where it ends. And then they talk about like maybe how it makes them feel. You know, I had students saying, yeah, it kind of reminds me of Christmas with all that red and green, you know, and right. That's, right? that's fair. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And um, you know, why is there a bed? Is this the living room or the bedroom? Like, where are they? You know? And so these are the kinds of, you know, things and that's, it's your first look at something. And of course that's valid because you have to start somewhere. And but a lot of people <clears throat> stop or, you know, that's kind of as far as it goes. And I think that it's so, um, for me, it's so rewarding to know more about that and more yeah, about and, the and I do, I want to say though, that if you ask me how this painting makes me feel, I would not only say, eh, it doesn't really make me feel much, right? but I would also uh, you know, if you demanded that I feel something about it, I would be a little annoyed because I would be okay. thinking like, I don't have a reaction. There's, I don't have the knowledge to have a reaction. Yeah. Don't make me have a reaction. That's how I would, <laughs> that's how I would take it. <laughs> yeah. And that's fair also. I mean, not every painting is going to wow you, you know, um, and not every painting wows me, even with my years of study in art history, I can still walk by paintings and be like, meh, that's fine. But, you know, there, you there are still moved to tears by everything you encounter. Yeah. But I, I mean, I think your, your state of knowledge can, uh, can deepen the reaction. Uh, right. But I, I also, I have to say in, in the sense of fairness here, there are some paintings that I would have uh, an immediate emotional reaction to uh, given what, like, even if, if it's a painting, I, I've had immediate reactions to paintings that I have no knowledge of context right. over. And uh, even older paintings that may be using a depth of symbolism that I am not aware of, um, yet uh, I am also quite aware that my state of knowledge could change my reaction at a future date when I have more knowledge. Right, right. That's, yeah, exactly. And um, so just to explain, when I was very early 20s, I went to Paris for the first time. I was by myself. I just wanted to go to Paris. I'd been a Francophile since I was six years old. And we had a French exchange student, Isabel, that I followed around everywhere trying to speak in a French accent. This is not the plot of Better Off Dead, though. No, <laughs> no. Okay. Um, and so I went to Paris and I went to as many museums as I could. And this is before, because I was a returning student. This was before I was trained in art history. And I was, you know, my mom brought us to art museums and she brought us. So I, you know, I'd been to art museums. I had loved art, but I decided to go to Paris and I went to all the museums and I went to the Rodin Museum. And I didn't really know that much about Rodin at the time, maybe very little. But um, I read, you know, I did my homework because that's always just the person I am. And I read all the guides. And I'm like, well, this looks like a great place. And it was close to Invalide where Napoleon was buried. And there's a beautiful park there. And, it, you know, I could walk there. So I went to the Rodin Museum. And I remember looking at the sculptures and just being so moved. And I didn't, I didn't have the knowledge I have now. And I turned the corner and I saw the sculpture of the kiss. And this is life size. Mm. Oh. And I gasped and I bawled. Yeah. I had this very strong reaction to it. That was my reaction when I saw Michelangelo's David. Right. And so even without knowing, I think you can definitely feel a yeah, connection. For sure. 
to art. But, but that's the, the context of your own personal history that you bring right. with it. Right. And so you can appreciate and you can understand and you can have this emotional reaction. But to speak the language and to understand what the painter, why he put in this versus this, I think is so great. It's like, for me, it's the difference between going to a bookstore and just looking at the covers versus going to a bookstore and opening up the pages. What's inside? You know, what are, what is the author telling? Uh, that's, that's a great uh, metaphor there. Yeah. So, um, so okay. Let's get, so, let's so let's, let's dig into it. Yeah. So we'll go here. Just a little biography. And again, this is something that I think is important. Um, so Jan van Eyck, he was born sometime before 1395. We don't have exact dates. And he died sometime before 1441. He was um, first kind of noted around 1422 is when we first see him um, painting. And this, and is, this is pre-New World Discovery. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and so he's up in Flanders, which is a little bit of northern France, um, parts of Belgium, and then a little part of the Netherlands. And there was this region called Flanders. And he also worked um, for the Duke of Burgundy in the, and for courtiers in the Burgundian court. And that was a kingdom within what is modern day France. Um, and for a long time, he was credited with inventing oil painting, although we know that's not true. Um, he invented a new technique, and that was to just put layer upon layer upon layer. And it's this technique that gives us this, when we go to look at the painting, and it's, it's definitely different on screen than seeing a painting in person. But there's this luminous quality, and that's because he put layer upon layer. Now, prior to this, they were using tempera paint, which is like this egg paint um, but he painted on panels, and so there's three wo wood panels in this painting put together. So that's what the painting. Oh, is so he on. painted on wood. It's yeah, and at this time they were painting on wood. Um, they did have okay. some canvas as well, but um, they often painted. So you get a lot of paintings on wood still in this time period. Um, but he kind of invented this technique that. Uh, where you just put layer and you, this is a, this really allows these deep, rich colors, these jewel tones as they're known now. And he also had a brother that painted and there's another reference to another Van Eyck a little bit later in France, likely a relative. So he, you know, there were painters in his family and he did pretty well. Um, he got a lot of commissions. Uh, some of them were religious. And again, this is, you know, everybody's Catholic. This is pre-Reformation. <laughs> So, um, you know, there, you paint for the church and it's the Holy Roman Empire at that point and the, and the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, so here's the painting, um, a little bit larger. And we're going to kind of break this down in sections and talk about different sections. Um, but this is a painting of, it's believed to be Giovanni Arnolfini and his wife. And he was from... Uh, region of Lucha in Italy, which is part of Tuscany. And he lived in Belgium and um, was a merchant. So he is wealthy. So he's an Italian merchant living in Belgium and this painting is done. And so it is a portrait of, it's now considered to be a dual portrait. But again, when I was taught art history, this was called the Arnolfini wedding portrait because it was believed to be a wedding and there's still some indications that it, uh, it could be, except, I don't know. The, and it's not believed fully that, that this is actually Giovanni Arnolfini. We know it's called the Arnolfini, but um, it was a popular name. So who knows? So there are a few things here. Uh, well, there's a lot here in terms of iconography or the symbolism. Now, there's also some things that Jan van Eyck is doing, and this is kind of like a resume for him because he shows how good of a painter he is with mm. this new technique and what he's doing. And even by today's standards, he is exemplary in technique. I mean, he is so good at what he's doing. Okay, so here we have Mr. Arnolfini, and here we have his wife. And a lot of, um, I'll give just some background of like what my students would often say. They're like, well, she's pregnant. 
right? But look at how much fabric is down at the bottom of her dress. She's holding her dress up, and that was a very normal thing. Now, one read of this, and again, this painting was um, in, 18, in the 1840s, was purchased by the National Gallery, and then you started having people kind of um, try to interpret it for the museum. And so one of the things was that she was holding up her dress um, as a way to, sh you know, sort of ensure that there would be children to show kind of this mock pregnancy. That was oh. one interpretation. And that's what I was taught when I was taught this is a wedding portrait, that she's putting that up there in order to like, a, you know, to ensure that they will have, um, you know, that she'll be fertile and they'll have a family. Now, can I, I just want to mention something here because, um, you know, I did not know that the title of this painting was the Arnolfini wedding, mm -hmm. but if she's pregnant at her wedding, then that puts a different story. Yeah, it's not that she's pregnant. It's that she is in sh like predicting fertility in the future. So she's yes, but if she, up. but yeah. if your interpretation is that she is pregnant, then it makes the story uh, take a different turn yeah it's it gets a little scandalous if you yeah. so yeah so but now it's believed well I'll, we'll go into that so that's just kind of the first um thing here so i'm going to go to the next slide and i have little close-ups in different sections so let's look at this top section now look at what they're wearing he's got fur lined and there's this sort of Jack, like this cloak over and you can tell he's got clothes under on underneath and that's she a has great hat a great hat yeah that's a that's a jamiroquai hat <laughs> um and then she's got this over like kind of dress thing with these long you know this fur lined and then this beautiful blue and you can see the sort of um pattern here so there's texture so this is expensive fabric the fur shows expensive she's got gold and then this very beautiful lace trimmed headdress so it they're very wealthy and they've got a lot of clothes on so what would that make you think uh, that it's a big wedding or it's winter right that it's cold oh Okay. Yeah. So if it's winter, why is the tree out here fruiting? <laughs> so it's interesting. There's like all of these sort of little dichotomies of, well, it's obviously summer if there's little um, cherries on this tree here, but yet, you know, they're dressed like they're going to go out into a blizzard. Um, and okay. then I just want to point out a few things, and I've got some more close ups here. So we have the chandelier. We have an inscription on the wall here, and we have this mirror. Okay. So oh, so you know when you when you're looking at the wide view, that mirror is not the first thing you notice. It just looks no. like some kind of a dish or a paint. Yeah, some kind of art thing on the wall, mm -hmm. right? So let's look at these a little closer. So this inscription on the wall is in Latin and says. Jan van Eyck was here. <laughs> That's like and a John Hancock signature. Yeah, 1434. Mm -hmm. And so that tells us it's Jan van Eyck's painting and we have the date right there. But why it was called the wedding portrait for so long is that this was believed to have been like sort of this witness, like he was a witness to the wedding, witness mm. to this event. Now, a more modern interpretation of this painting says that this was painted shortly after his wife died, and it's a memorial painting. Oh. And so if you look at the chandelier, there's one candle, and it's on the side of Mr. Arnolfini. And this could mean that there's life on this side. But if you know Renaissance iconography, the candle is an allusion to God. And so when I first learned about this painting, that was that God was presiding over this wedding, this union between two people. So now we have sort of conflicting ideas. Yeah, because it's, it's almost just like one a candle. Mystery. Yeah, what? It's, it's one candle. It's one candle, right? Well, you just need one to represent God. You don't need the whole chandelier. 
but and yet there are several empty mm -hmm. candle holders right and you would think that they're showing wealth everywhere else why you know and having candles is another sign of wealth why is there only mm -hmm. one but if you look at this one see how it looks like there's wax and oh, it's burned it, out it's burned out that that's some credibility to this new theory mm -hmm. that this is a memorial portrait and she died in childbirth very okay. interesting now when you look at this mirror close up these little round dells all around the outside um and these are tiny if you go to see the painting i mean these are smaller than a dime these little round dells and they have the stations of the cross in them and you can when you see the painting you can make out which was which wow so Very it's interesting. that level of detail huh extremely and this is what jan van eyck is known for is this exquisite detail and then in particularly it starts with him but in the northern renaissance they were known for using a one-haired brush to get that detail that's it's remarkable insane. it is it the, i absolutely love the northern renaissance they're so it's just minute detail uh can you just uh, describe for a second uh what uh what you mean by the northern Re renaissance so the there's the italian renaissance in the italian mm -hmm. peninsula and then there's the northern renaissance which would be in france germany netherlands flanders and the artistic styles are very different okay now you're talking about northern uh continental europe, europe northern continental right? then there's also the english renaissance that yeah. starts a little bit later so the renaissance as we describe the time period starts in italy and then ideas spread Okay. And it spreads to the north and then it spreads over to England. Is okay. kind of the time. So you wouldn't consider the uh the English Renaissance part of the Northern Renaissance? No, the the paintings are different, the literature's different. I mean, that's okay. Shakespeare, that's Queen Elizabeth, that's right. yeah. Right. That's much later than this. Yeah. Yep. So um so we're up here. So the Northern and just the painting styles, I mean, we'll do an Italian Renaissance episode as well. So um, you can see the very vast difference in the way that things were painted. Now, also in the North, they had a lot more secular art, whereas in the South, and this is particularly later, um, most of the Renaissance art is religious in nature. Now, there are some portraits of, you know, the Medici and the Borgia, some great families and things like that. But in general, the paintings tend to be um, all religious. And in the North, they did have religious paintings, but you see more secular things as well. Paintings okay. of landscapes and non-religious things. So just some differences there. Um, so let's go back to the Arnolfini portrait here. And in this mirror, you can see that um, there's the back of Mrs. Arnolfini, the back of Mr. Arnolfini, and you have two people coming in through the door here mm. it's believed because of the signature above that one of these is a self-portrait of john van eyck and why again the wedding argument works is that they would be witnessing the wedding you would still mm -hmm. need witnesses in this time period yeah that mirror really changes uh the 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 story mm -hmm. and i think that's one thing that I didn't get from my first take on it is what the story is, you know? So for right. me, um, coming from that film and literature background, I'm looking for who's the protagonist? <laughs> uh, what do they want in this story? What kind of actions are they doing to get it? And what their obstacles are. Right. That's how I see the world. And, um, and to see the, more depth to this painting changes my outlook. And then there's the, the mastery of it, which is a separate question altogether. I mean, you, this is clearly a, a, a convex mirror because yeah. of the curve. Right. And that's just pretty stunning. That's pretty and, stunningly executed. Right. And so it's, that's what I'm talking about. He is, a master painter and he's dealing with a new medium i mean he is a virtuoso he's a genius really you know if you want to mm -hmm. use those terms but um and because he's figuring this out this hasn't been done before 
and he's playing and he is, this is just such a masterful painting. Yeah. I mean, if you think about painters as having a subject sit before them and, and attempting to copy what they see before them. Right. Then you look at this mirror and you realize that that, that had to be done at least in part from his imagination. Right. Because this couldn't be staged. And then look, you know, how he gets the, you know, because if it's a convex mirror, then the walls will warp and everything. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's It's amazing. done from, it, I mean, he would have had to, I mean, I could imagine a scenario in which he set up a huge mirror and then uh, tried to work out the lines and the curves and, and so on. But to, uh, to stage this from this perspective would have been enormously difficult, if not impossible. Right. So it's, it, yeah, I'm just always, when I start thinking about it, I'm like, oh my gosh, the, you know, I've tried to paint. I, when I got my art history degree, I had to take painting classes and I, I'm not good at it. It's okay. I'm good at other things, but that's why I'm like, oh, and on. I think that's why in my program, they wanted you to paint because then you can understand even more appreciate what these masters were doing. Okay, ready to move on mm -hmm. to another section of the painting? Okay, so this looks like just a little bit, and it is just a little bit. We're only looking at, um, oops, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get my, I, this is off here, it shouldn't be. We're looking at the window, right? So we've got three different sections. So here we have that, um, that ripe fruit right up here just a close up so you can see that there are really are cherries. And then this middle painting, he has put colored glass okay. in here. And again, like I said, this was sort of his resume. He's showing his skill mm -hmm. because you see the light and then there's shadow in those, like the circular patterns, the perspective is spot on. Um, and it's just incredible. Now, in the bottom part of this window, we see these oranges on the windowsill and mm -hmm. then on the table. Now, that is another thing of symbolism because those were expensive fruits. So now we're seeing Arnolfini's wealth again. Mm -hmm. And another interpretation is that maybe he was a merchant of oranges and that's where he got his wealth. They were imported from Italy to the north. Mm. Okay. So interesting. Um, and then this is the bottom section of the painting. And those are his shoes, not hers. Okay. And he is just in his like stocking feet, as my uh -huh. grandmother would have said. What are you doing in your stocking feet? So he's in his stocking feet and he has his shoes off. Now there's symbolism for that. That is that when um, someone has their shoes off, this is a sacred ceremony, which mm -hmm. puts, pushes, you know, pushes us back into that idea of the wedding. And we see this little dog, and he's, you know, a cute little dog. Again, um, on the shoes to see the texture of the wood, the different um, sort of texture from the leather, the little rivets that attach the strap. And then we see the dog in this such detail. I mean, it looks like one-haired brush putting in mm -hmm. those little tiny gray hairs on this little dog. And he's a cute little dog. And you think, okay, there's a pet. I didn't know they had dog pets in the Renaissance, but sure. But the dog actually is a symbol for fidelity. Well, there's another thing I would not have known. <laughs> right. So if you, we don't see a lot of dogs in portraits um, in this time period, but if you do, it's usually a portrait of a couple as a, represent a representation of fidelity. Now, where does that even come from, though? You know, you always hear dogs are loyal. It's just, you know, I, these symbols evolve over time. And I guess, you know, it's, yeah. it's like, um, I mean, it is a language, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we, even with our modern English language, if we go back more than a couple hundred years, uh, I'm sure it would be impenetrable to our modern ears. Yeah. So as as the the vocabulary of language changes over and, time. Right. And that's what, you know, the example with the peacock from Rome to the early Christian mm -hmm. period. Um, and it changes 
as cultures evolve and change. I mean, that was the same region, but the ideology changes. And so the symbols change meaning. Mm, Okay. And then sometimes you get symbols coming in from different cultures. They're borrowed and then they're sort of adapted through diffusion of ideas and things like that. Um, So it's, I think it's really fascinating to want to understand these. Um, And um, I remember I really enjoyed the symbolism part of art history. So I did a lot of extra reading on it because it is like learning a new language. Sure. Okay. Um, And then this last picture here is just the fabric on the ground, which you you don't get this level of an understanding when you just look at the full view on a computer screen. No. Yeah. This is, uh, this is another level and to see that kind of detail, I mean, you could really just, you know, just fold yourself up in that fabric. It's, you can just feel the texture of it. Right. And it's, um, it's lined, but fabric was really expensive. So this is another symbol of wealth. The mm-hmm. fact that she's got her, this, you know, clo- kind of overcoat. Um, not only is it fur lined and have this kind mm-hmm. of, it looks like a thick fur or wool lining. There's a lot of it. Yeah. And it's dragging on the it's ground. It's voluminous. Yeah. Um, and so th- again, this is, you know, showing wealth. Okay. And so let's take a look at Mr. Arnolfini. Now, again, we have this layering of paint and that's why his, the light coming in Um, If you look at paintings a little bit earlier or paintings before some of these techniques head down to Italy in the Renaissance, you don't see that luminescence. Now, da Vinci was a master at this and he did his underpainting and like greens and stuff on human skin because skin isn't just one tone. There's a lot of complexity to it, the colors. And this starts here with Jan van Eyck and you can see that Um, paint that coming in but that you know even where the light is really bright on his face there's so many different tones and this is done by building up paint slowly now oil paint doesn't dry fast it dries very slowly so it allows the painter a lot of time to come back in and manipulate things Mm. And they would also sort of water down the oil paint. It it would be done not with water, but with, you know, some other things. And so they would thin out the oil paints to just build color and texture on top. With a a thinner, like, turpentine or something like that. Yeah, something of the equivalent. So they would thin out the paints as well. And then they would just layer them and layer them to get these really vibrant colors. Um, Yeah, well, this is another thing that you don't really see at the full view, you really have to take a closer look. I mean, the shadows that play away from the light source mm-hmm. are that there, there is a lot of gradation to it. It's not like a solid block. Right. And you um, still get this, the, the skin tone, uh, even in the shadows. Absolutely. And the variations of the tones, mm-hmm. right? Um, and then you see that he's got a ring on um, the bands around his wrist. There's some embellishment. Okay, so I want to say these... something about the the ring yeah. that's on his hand, uh, the one that's on his right hand, mm-hmm. which I again didn't notice at the full view. Right. And to to be perfectly honest, uh, this gesture that he's doing with his uh, right hand, you know, this gesture mm-hmm. here, I associate that, and this is one of those things that uh, is a danger of uh, having your first reaction be set in stone. But this gesture is something that I've associated with Catholic priests Mm -hmm. uh, blessing you. Yep. Because the full motion would indicate the, the sign of the Holy Cross. And so from that association, he embodied, uh, like, again, this quick, immediate reaction that I had made me think of him as some kind of a a priest because yeah, because when, because the full view doesn't allow me to see the, the detail of the fabrics, the, the, the fur, all I see is this long kind of garment that I associate with priests. 
Interesting. That's so, really, yeah. And the collar as well, even right, though it's not collar. the high collar, even though the, there's no, um, it's not a white collar, but it is, um, it is, it's a short collar that's folded up. Right. One of the other things that I associate with priests. So that's why I, I wanted to bring that up because I'm disabused of my notions about who this is, not just from our conversation here, but by going in and looking at the details. Right. And that's another thing, you know, I, I was, I went to college and I got my art history degree and a lot of the stuff I learned were from, you know, projected slides, um, onto a screen in the classroom and textbook images, you know, so everything is really flattened, which is why I would always tell my students, go to museums because it's so different to see the painting. Yeah. So when you see this painting, it's not a huge painting. It's not like, you know, some of Ruben's paintings are like the size of a wall in a bedroom. I mean, they're massive. This isn't a massive painting, but you can get and you can see and you see all these details and you can see the brush strokes and the, the paint um, being layered and layered and layered. Uh, and it's, I mean, I think it's just, it's so rich to see. But by breaking it down like this, and this is how I would teach the paintings in my class, I would section them out because it's when you get to see these little details, you're like, oh, now I get it. But without yeah. doing this and just looking at a painting, I think that you just, you miss it. And that's okay because not everybody wants to do deep dives into paintings. But I think if you, you know, have some interest or if you're teaching your kids art and a little bit of art history along with history, this is a great exercise. Yeah. And I, I, I think that, uh, another aspect of appreciation for this work, uh, has to do with the, the understanding of where this lives in the context of history. Right. Uh, we're, we're talking about here at the early, um, side of it is early. the great masters who would follow him. Absolutely. And so, Knowing that, uh, and so there, there's that aspect of it, and um, to know at now of where he arrived at in history, and then to go in and look at the detail and the, um, the sheer accomplishment of it. You know, we talk about what kind of, um, you know, uh, spiritual value this can give to you. Right. If you are presented with something that is uh, a work of genius, you don't necessarily know that it's genius uh, unless you know the greater context where, where it comes in history. You know, if you look at the Wright Brothers plane, you don't know what an achievement is that necessarily unless you know that it's the first to ever fly. Exactly. Right. And that's that context. That's that piece to really fully like just immerse yourself in what you're looking at. Right. And, and then <clears throat> to tie this back to the spiritual value, there is something inspiring about looking at an achievement of genius. Yes. To, to, to know, to understand why it's genius to, to know what an accomplishment it is. I'll be honest with you. You know, if I'm, if I'm walking down a museum, probably with you, uh, and I, I might just walk past this painting without knowing that context. And now I would, it would be the kind of thing I would seek out right. because I know the context. And I would seek it out because uh, I have a better understanding of why it's good and to think of it, see, there's a, there are layers to this, obviously. I yeah. mean, we're just, we're talking about uh, this, the value you can get out of it. There's the aspect of accomplishment, and then there's the aspect of the storytelling in this as well. So right. to know the, uh, what the underlying story was, to know that the painter himself suffered a tragedy, uh, to know that uh, to think of him as the witness to this uh, this wedding, and to think of it as his um, 
you know, if, if it is the case that this was his tribute to that, to think that perhaps he didn't lose what made him love before this adds to that, the storytelling that's taking place. Yeah, it's, um, I just, there's just, there's so much in this particular painting, which is why I wanted to start with this one. For mm -hmm. me, it was the low hanging fruit, right? Because <laughs> um, this is the one that wows at all the students like, oh my gosh, you got that out of this. Mm -hmm. And um, so I thought we would start here. And then, you know, we'll, we'll look at some things that, you know, some people are going to love, some people are not going to love, you're going to like, but I think the idea of appreciation, whether you respond emotionally or you even like it for whatever reason, you hopefully what we can do for people is to get them to appreciate. Yeah. And, and to things. think and not just, um, uh, not to, to be able to think about it in, in a way that allows you to understand what you like. Right. And, and I think that it ultimately may be the greatest value of this is that it, by becoming a more informed um, viewer of art, then perhaps you may be able to define and seek out the things that you will like, which is a, will, would be an unending value for the rest of your right. life. Right. It's true. Absolutely. And, it, it allows you to give things maybe more of a chance than you would have otherwise. Because like you said, you probably would have just walked by, but now you're like, I would go look for this painting in the National Gallery. And it's in Gallery 63 in the National Gallery in London, <laughs> in case anybody needs to know. Well, I know that we have a podcast listener in the United Kingdom. Uh, yeah. I don't, I don't know if this will actually be in um, one of our podcast episodes because it's strictly video, but right. maybe we'll figure out how to make it a, a video podcast. We'll, we'll see. We'll figure something. Yeah. Oh, well, okay. So uh, to wrap things up, do you have anything else you want to add to yeah, this? Yeah. So or? we haven't looked at her yet. So let me just. Oh God. We got yeah, one okay. more slide. All right. Here we go. Okay. So holding this dress up, look at how much fabric is at the bottom. That was mm -hmm. typical in this day. So it may not even be an allusion to hopefully someday she will be fertile and have a baby. It could just be because I got a lot of fabric and I'm going to trip. It could be as simple as that, right? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, going down and upstairs in a long gown, we hold the, our dresses up so we don't fall. Mm -hmm. um, so you get to see her a little bit. Again, that very luminous, um, you know, skin tones. Mm -hmm. Now, in the Renaissance, they still haven't mastered hands. Hands are one of the, hands and feet are yeah. some of the hardest things to paint. Is that so an anatomy thing? Is that like an... Yeah, it's, they're we, very, very difficult. Like I know Da Vinci, um, you know, did, 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 did he dig up cadavers or study cadavers? Or? Well, they all did in the Renaissance. Um, well, Michelangelo as well. But I mean, yeah. if you look at their notebooks, you will see pages and pages and pages of them practicing hands. Yeah. It's really fascinating. So anyway, the hands have not been mastered. She's got these weird, spindly, creepy hands, but so does he. Um, now notice her hairline, how far back that is. Mm -hmm. It was high fashion to have a really re high receding hairline for women. Mm -hmm. And they would actually shave their heads back. Oh. And so when you see paintings of women in the North, particularly, and even in Italy, it was um, somewhat common. Their, their hairline is like way back here. And that was considered a symbol of beauty. Like that was more beautiful because you had this really big forehead just as an aside i okay. had no idea yeah so that's why you know they're like whoa and then i feel like i'm going to be saying that a lot during this series <laughs> i had no idea yeah um and so again just some detail on her gown in this last picture over here that you know the fur lining and then all of this gathering lots of mm -hmm. fabric lots of wealth i i love the the way that it folds under her belt. Mm -hmm. That's it's all gathered. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is... And the, look at the texture on that blue kind right? of... Right? That's what I was saying. It's a, it's um, like a brocade a, or a not lace. Not an undergarment, but because that's a it's, coat, right? That yeah, it's probably wearing. a dress, but yeah. it's got this lace or brocade, yeah. which is expensive. Mm -hmm. um, now, this is the living room. And you're like, bed in a living room? Yes. 
because it was expensive to have a bed. So you could put them in the living room and that was common. Or it could also be the bedroom and it was very common to receive people in the bedroom. I mean, I, I watch a lot of period films and you always see people barging into the king or the queen or the princess in the bedroom and you're like, whoa, that's kind of intimate. No, that was normal. They conducted a lot of their business in their bedrooms. It was just what they did. Okay. So it's not really emblematic of an additional layer of intimacy. No, it's just no, a sign of wealth. The way it was. Okay, Another sign, sign of, of wealth. wealth. Okay. Yeah, they got a nice big bed. Yeah, they have some money. Okay. The same way, I mean, how do we show a, a flashy car in the modern mm -hmm. day? Same thing. This is the, uh, uh, the episode of Cribs We Never Knew We Needed. <laughs> right. Um, so that pretty much wraps it up. We have the Arnolfini wedding. Um, and again, this is believed to be uh, Jan van Eyck, a self-portrait. Um, and man in red turban. And again... It's like almost every one of his paintings is a resume because just the, you know, you see the cracking and that's due to time and stuff on the man with in the red turban, but the layer of fabric and the skin tones and it's just so amazing. He is an, I mean, he is a genius at what he was doing and he yeah. set the tone for what could be done. And then you had people like Da Vinci and others no, I think that, followed it, that just excelled at it too. I mean, I think as, as far as judging him as a genius, it helps to know who his contemporaries were so that mm -hmm. you can understand what the level of the competition was. So, right. And this is pre Da Vinci, right? So this is earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you, you have um, amazing perspective. Now this is post um, like Chimabui and Giotto because they're in the late 1300s and they really helped with understanding perspective. So he's kind of in the middle there between those two camps. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so that I guess wraps it up for the first episode of the language of art. And uh, in future episodes, we'll be looking a lot of different forms of art not just paintings we'll look at poetry maybe uh we'll turn the tables a little bit and do some film we'll see yep. but uh i'm looking forward to it this was re a real eye-opener <laughs> <laughs> so okay. thank you for that and we'll see you next time yep on the language of art <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>